Good morning, uh, viewers and uh, listeners of Concerned uh, Citizens Media. Uh, thank you again for joining me. Uh, I always appreciate uh, your presence for uh, this presentation. And uh, I also appreciate your uh, uh, sharing, subscribing, and uh, liking, plus commenting on my video so we can grow. Thank you again. So uh, today is uh, January the 30th, 2022. So I will start today with a uh, uh, former Ethiopian uh, woman, children and youth uh, minister, uh, Filson Abdullahi interview on CNN. Uh, for just for uh, re for your refreshment, I will read just one page uh, about her uh, position and uh, also why she resigned uh, from her ministerial position. Uh, <clears throat> Filson Abdullahi Ahmed resigned from her post as Minister of Women, Children and the use affairs citing personal reasons behind her decision this was done like uh, around september 27 or 28 2021 uh, philan uh, Phil, philson who is a, a speech and a language therapy consultant by training became known for her stand on issues related to women rights and Ethio Somali writes, she is the founder of Nabad TV, the first private TV channel in Af Somali. Before being appointed as Minister of Women, Children and Youth Affairs, she was first appointed as Federal Goodwill Ambassador by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. She was appointed as Minister of uh, minister on March 12, 2020, replacing Yalem Sagai at the time. Uh, amid pressures and the criticism of the minister's silence, uh, or ministry's, ministry's silence on sexual violence on Tigray, she confirmed that conclusive evidence was found that sexual violence occurred in the Tigray region. She said in a series of tweets posted on her official Twitter account in February 2021. We have received the report back from our task force team on the ground in the Tigray region. They have unfortunately established Rape uh, has taken place conclusively and without a doubt. She promised to deliver justice and announced the establishment of a task force. As the task force included a team from the Attorney General's office, which are currently processing the data in terms of numbers, we await the investigation of this horrible crimes and hopefully see when the perpetrators are brought to justice. However, in her resignation uh, letter that was addressed to Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and shared on social media, she highlighted the reasons behind her resignation and acknowledged challenges and the failure due to financial and bureaucratic strains. She said, despite working through the pressure and strain of any job, I hope you will agree on the importance of the difference between when we should work through challenges and when it is time to leave a position, adding any situation that compromises my ethics is contrary to my convictions and values and betraying these beliefs 
is a breach of trust to myself and our citizens. Filan Filsan concluded her letter by offering her resignation effective immediately, she said, for reasons of personal nature that weigh heavily on my con conscience. I regretfully submit my letter of resignation effective immediately. So this was uh, done in around September uh, 27 or 28, 2021. I just want to uh, read it uh, so to, you know, to refresh who she is. And uh, I will start with her interview uh, on the media. And uh, I, I also I also reported at the time on this uh, resignation. It's very encouraging, and she is you know uh, the right kind of person. Uh, you know, I I agree with his decision to resign. She you know if you want to lie, just like other uh, prosperity party officials, she could do and stay on the position and. Uh, you know, enjoy her salary, but she is uh, a man of principle, and uh, uh, she don't want to cover up the crimes committed in Tigray, uh, just like the other uh, prosperity officials, and she's from Somalia, you know, she could just enjoy the salary and uh, stay on the job, uh, but she is a different woman, and we encourage such kind of leadership. So many prosperity party officials are on position despite all the lies, all the lies and all the cover up uh, about Ahmed policies and atrocities uh, in Tigray, in Oromia and other areas. So still I appreciate her. Uh, we have to appreciate her, her dedication, her principle and for standing for her ethics. Let's listen what she say on this interview and uh, I will jump on other news. Thank you again. Let's see. Come on. There we go. Your open letter to the Ethiopian people says you have great concern and sensitivity for the future of the country and the people. But let's start from the beginning. Four months ago, you resigned from the government of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Why did you do that? Well, I saw Ethiopian uh, system of governance is not reformable within. So I had to step out and I had to speak up, even though I was speaking. Um, and I've been very vocal from the beginning, but I had to do it from outside the government. Why do you say it was not reformable? That is a very strong statement. <laughs> well, we had, we had all the promises and the hopes. We had a young African rising prime minister with the, with the hope of bringing new beginnings and all those uh, hopes were dashed. You were the first federal official, a senior government official to say conclusively that rape was used as a weapon of war in the Tigray conflict. But that was in a tweet. It didn't come in an official government report. There was no press release. Why did you do this in almost like in a personal capacity? I, I think I've explained a little bit on my Washington interview the reasons behind why I had to do it on my personal Twitter, which was uh, uh, all the pressures coming from the government and the PP, all the pro prosperity party, to put the lead on or to cover up. So I had to use any means that I can come out and speak to the Ethiopian people as well as other uh, stakeholders. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed went to the front lines to lead the fight against the Tigray People's Liberation Front. You say in your open letter to the Ethiopian people that this is a man who has a Nobel Peace Prize in one hand and a gun in the other. As somebody who was in his government, what do you make of his handling of the situation? He's, he's obviously mishandled this whole situation in the country. And we were not expecting to be in this situation to begin with. So we have a prime minister who's holding a Nobel Peace Prize and a gun in the other, and the population is so polarized and divided. And the division among groups is 
beyond uh, with a deep rooted issues. So on top of that, like I've said, we have a man who was supposed to lead the country out of the pro out of all the problems that we had, yet we regressed back and we are in this situation. And there's no way um, I don't believe the prime minister has the capacity to bring the people out of this. And of course, I've, I would repeat saying that we are a free fall of a, a one man hubris and a one man provider and narcissism that has brought and lead, led us to this mess. I have covered Ethiopia extensively. This is a very divisive subject. There are people who will call you a liar for even speaking out. So why are you doing this? Well, I'm someone who was in the government. I'm someone who has been very vocal from the beginning. I I spoke when the when war broke at first, third of November. I wrote and I put statements out there saying for everyone there has to be there has to be the civilians has to be the utmost uh, prioritization of this conflict. We have to make sure women, children, and the infirm are protected in this conflict. So we have to speak regardless of what people are gonna call us or shame us or name us for. We have to speak when we see injustice. And that is what I'm trying to do. The United Nations Human Rights Commission, lots of other independent bodies have put out reports that say all sides have committed atrocities in this conflict, that people have been misused in this conflict. Do you think things have changed since you left the government? No, I don't think. I don't think much has changed. Yes, we see uh, the prisoners are coming out. We see um, the country is trying to lift its emergency state, but there's so much uh, humanitarian crisis unfolding. We've got the drought, we've got the looming famine, we've got the seas of uh, a whole region more than a year, and we have a generation of young people traumatized, raped, women raped. So no, I don't. The African Union, the UN, the US, lots of other international partners are trying to mediate between the TPLF and the Ethiopian government. What do you want the international community to know about the situation in Ethiopia? Abby cannot be the referee and the player at the same time on the field. They need to understand there has to be uh, a sequence prior to the negotiations that he proposed. There has to be a ceasefire prior to all of this, a cessation of hostility. There has to be a way forward to putting immediate humanitarian actions in place for regions that are at most risk of facing famine, facing medical issues. So I believe the international has a task to play, a role to play in this. And I know there are many countries and international have been putting forward pressures that they need to push more and they need to find a way for the country to heal. It's a time for the country where we need to move to a position of healing. And I don't think the prime minister is ready to do that. I don't think the prime minister is the right person to do that. Yes, though, I believe the prime minister should compromise as the head of the nation, as the prime minister of the country. He should compromise. He should put the people at first, and he needs to act accordingly. He needs to come to his sense. The situation looks bleak in Ethiopia. What do you think in your mind is the future? What is the way forward out of this conflict that has been raging for 15 months? I want to send a message to the African Union, who's been irrelevant in this conflict. I believe the African um, summit is taking place in February. I hope when African countries come together that they will put forward a pressure as countries to say there's a, there needs to be a cessation of hostility, there has to be a ceasefire, and that their summit can put some pressure in the government as well as other active agents in this uh, conflict. Felton Ahmed Abdullahi, thank you for talking to us here on CNN. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Okay, that's... Uh... Felsan Abdullahi, uh, uh, interview with CNN. Uh, so, uh, 
has okay i have another court justice stephen Gr okay yes. uh, i will come back to other videos at the end so we should appreciate her for speaking up for telling the truth for challenging the prime minister the others no they are just just uh lying with him and uh, enjoying their salary they don't care about uh, you know humanity's uh, suffering uh, the genocide happening and the ongoing bloodshed they don't care they just clap their hands take their salary lie with him and uh, cover up uh, whatever he do so we should appreciate her encourage her and uh, for speaking up and uh, for standing for the principle for the principles and uh, for uh, you know having ethical standard so thank you and she said prime minister is you know well, he cannot be trusted he cannot uh, he doesn't have the capacity to take the country out of this uh, misery so the international community the african union europe us uh, and the united nations all this should play uh, their role their part uh, to uh, save the country from this uh, failed leadership from prosperity party and plus from prime minister abi ahmed so i will uh, continue to the other uh, news thank you again uh, the first one I just this is a reading uh, I shared from uh, Facebook from Facebook are uh, Fasi Gamada posted this on her Facebook December 3 2021 it says like this oh, Borana is bleeding Guji is bleeding Hararge is bleeding Wollo is bleeding Ilu Ababora is bleeding. Wollega is bleeding. Arsi is bleeding. Shoa is bleeding. Jimma is bleeding. Karayu is bleeding. And at the end she say, Oromia is bleeding. This is very strong, very strong uh, reality on the ground in Ethiopia. So actually the whole ethiopia is bleeding under abi ahmed and the prosperity party leadership so ethiopia and uh, in general uh, ethiopians need you know a miracle to save them from this bleeding from this uh, catastrophe uh, so this very strong statement all region all regions and uh, ethiopia as a country is bleeding under abi ahmed's leadership <clears throat> uh, so what he do instead of uh, you know saving the country from uh, bloodshed civil war what he's doing he is in abu dhabi to get more drones to get more fun um, finance to continue the bloodshed that's why filson uh, former minister filson abdullah said he is not capable of solving uh, ethiopia's problem so this is about his visit in abu dhabi daily news egypt ethiopia prime minister abi ahmed arrives in uae only for three days after al sis al sisi's visit Ethiopia Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed arrived on Saturday to the United Arab Emirates, uh, capital of Abu Dhabi, on an official visit to the UAE, where he was received by Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan. The two sides discussed the path of cooperation and the joint action and the opportunities to strengthen them between the UAE and Ethiopia in various fields in order to serve 
the overall development effort in both countries and their mutual interest in addition to all regional and international issues of common concern. Bin Ziad welcomed the Ethiopian Prime Minister's visit to the country, expressing his pride in the constructive relations of friendship that the UAE and Ethiopia have fostered over the past years through sincere work for the benefit of their people and the security and the stability of the region. No, this is a lie. The two sides also exchanged views on the latest regional and international development and a number of issues of common concern, particularly the peace effort in the Horn of Africa. The Ethiopian Prime Minister visit to Abu Dhabi carries with it, with it special significance through the solidarity and the strong condemnation of the Houthi terrorist attack announced by the Ethiopian Foreign Minister. Ethiopia has expressed its full solidarity with the United Arab Emirates in all actions taken by taken to safeguard the security and the safety of its citizens and the, over, the sovereignty of its territory. Since Abiy Ahmed assumed the Ethiopian Premiership in April 2018, United Arab Emirates and Ethiopia relations have been developed in various fields especially in the economy and the flow of UAE investment. For his part, Ahmed praised the UAE's approach in its relation with countries which are based on wise and balanced diplomacy that seeks to establish stability, peace in all countries of the world. No, not really. He reiterated Ethiopia's solidarity with the UAE in all the steps it takes to maintain its security and the territorial integrity, strengthening that the terrorist attack constitutes a serious threat to regional security and the peace, undermines peace effort in the region, and violates all international and humanitarian norms and laws. Crown Prince bin Ziad al Nahi received. Uh, last Wednesday, Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi and uh, pledged to continue to work against regional intervention and attempts to sow division between the countries of the region. So, Daily News Egypt reported on this one. So, it's not about all these uh, positive statements. The main reason is to get the drones and to get more finance from Abu Dhabi so he can continue uh, you know, the bloodshed in Ethiopia. It's not about bilateral relationship. It's not about strengthening UAE-Ethiopia relationship. No, this is about promoting him, promoting him and keeping him in position and allowing him to continue the genocide in Tigray in, in Oromia. So, the UAE, if, uh, if you want to uh, play a major role in the future uh, peaceful country in Ethiopia, stop supporting genocide in Ethiopia. Stop providing drones and money for this guy. This guy is a failed leader. So stop uh, you know, uh, giving him drones and uh, money and uh, you know, uh, consultation. And uh, if you want to play a major role in future uh, Ethiopia, a future Ethiopia after Abi Ahmed, instead of uh, playing uh, your, your part in genocide and all atrocities happening in Oromia and in Tigray region, please stop. <clears throat> More than eight eight hundred thousand people vulnerable in eight drought-affected zones in Oromia. Over four million people in need of assistance due to conflict. That's that kind of the country he's leading. Too much trouble in every corner. The Oromia region disaster risk and the development induced displacement and the resettlement commission announced that 
over 800,000 pe pe people in eight drought affected zones in the region seek assistance. The Commission also disclosed that over 4 million people in conflict affected area in the region are being provided with aid. The Commissioner of the Oromia Region Disaster Risk and Development Induced Displacement and the Resettlement Commission, Mustafa Kadir, told the local news agency that 800,244 people are in need of assistance because of drought caused by rain shortage in eight zones of southern Oromia. The Commission also stated that cattle are dying due to a lack of uh, fodder. Almost uh, more than, I think, 100,000 died uh, in the uh, uh, Borana area. <clears throat> According to him, the drought may persist for three months. He warned that the situation in is dire and beyond the government's capacity. According to the commissioner, the government is working on preventing the deaths from hunger, including cattle, but it is struggling to provide fodder for over 6 million cattle. The commissioner stated that the government has taken various measures to address the problem. He said, so far, 197,896 quintals of food was distributed to the drought-affected Borona zone alone, further outlining the government's effort to provide water and cattle feed. The weather forecast indicated the three months duration of the drought. Mukhtar said, detailing directives set by the regional government to organize the 21 zonal and 18 city administrations to assist by producing cattle food. He also noted that the regional government resettled most vulnerable animals to the neighboring zones. Additional 4,976,981 people from the conflict-affected area who are in need of assistance are being provided with 1,587,694 quintals of grain and donated 51,755,000 Ethiopian burr in cash. The communicate the commissioner said. The commissioner reiterated that the crisis cannot be tackled by the government alone and called on business owners, governmental and non-governmental organizations and aid agencies to play their part in producing and transporting further as well as providing assistance to those in need. So, yes, it's a good call, but it's too late. It's too late after so many animals died. First time, Prosperity Party uh, attempted to hide this because they want to just show uh, growth, prosperity. You know, they don't want to talk about the negative. That's why this thing uh, extensively damaged uh, the community and the credit for this one are this standard now uh, if he made such call at the beginning when this was clear instead of playing politics you know instead of trying to cover up uh, all these animal deaths uh, could be uh, uh, prevented here is this also another trouble Nearly 40% of people in Ethiopia's Tigray lack adequate food, according to WFP. 15 months of war have left nearly 40% of the people in T Ethiopia's Tigray region without enough food, as aid groups struggle to reach cut-off areas, the World Food Program said on Friday. 
also the ability of aid workers to integrate improve during the summer months and uh, kept starvation at bay for people there no aid convoy has reached Tigray since mid-December, the United Nations Agency said in an assessment. Many people were using extreme coping strategies like cutting the number of meals they eat daily, it said. A new food security assessment released today, released by, by the United Nations World Food Program, shows that Almost 40% of Tigrayans are suffering an extreme lack of food after 15 months of conflict, it said. The Tigray region has a population of about 5.5 million people. So 40% is almost half of the population in a very uh, dire need of food. <clears throat> The assessment said that across Tigray and the neighboring regions of Afar and Amara, also affected by the war, an estimated 9 million people need food aid. Yes, crazy situation under Rabi Ahmed. Crazy. Government spokesman Lega Satullu didn't immediately respond to a request for comment on the WFP assessment. On Monday, he accused the TPLF of using hunger as a political tool. The report comes with international concerns over humanitarian access to Tigray region mounting again. The Ethiopian government said last week that 43 trucks would deliver food and other aid to Tigray, but no trucks have uh, arrived as fighting raged along the border between the Afar and the Tigray regions. On Friday, the government said a convoy carrying food and medicine was forced to turn back due to fighting it blamed on TPLF. A doctor of a doctor at the Haider Referral Hospital in Tigray, regional capital Mekele, told Reuters that hospital staff have not been paid in eight months. So they are just working without any salary. Just like other, uh, uh, you know, senior citizens, retirees, or government works, they don't get paid after you know after the war started almost for uh, a year some doctors and the nurses have had their own children admitted to the hospital for malnutrition and uh, some staff have res resorted to begging for food the doctor told Reuters on Thursday this is horrible horrible situation the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA, said on Friday that all international aid groups operating in Tigray had run out of fuel and were delivering what aid they could, they could on foot. The government spokesperson didn't immediately respond to a request for comment on that report. OCHA spokesperson Jens Lar Larke told reporters in Geneva that aid groups operating in Tigray had told the agency that if there is no, cha no change in conditions, they will be unable to provide anything by the end of February. So we, we have to expect uh, this this if uh, the situation is not changed and the food and the other fuels uh, the other basic uh, uh, aids uh, if they are not delivered that will be a serious a serious uh, challenge for uh, catastrophe for uh, you know the people of Tigray So what the government is doing, what the government, the Ethiopian government is doing, 
uh, instead of uh, dealing with all the problems I mentioned, the drought in Oromia, the shortage of food in Tigray, and the other challenges we have, you know, what they're doing, putting more money in defense. The next report is that Parliament approved 90 billion bur for Ministry of Defense. This is what they do. This is they do this instead of, you know, uh, declaring ceasefire, solving the problem in diplomatic way, dealing, you know, the displaced people and uh, dealing with the drought dealing with the shortage of food. But as the minister said, these guys, they don't have uh, the ability to govern, to lead the country. She's right. She's right. They want to fight. They want to get drones. They want to spend more money and uh, continue the bloodshed between brothers and uh, keep their position. That's their interest. Let's read. The House of People's Representative has uh, approved an additional budget of 122 billion Ethiopian beer, out of which the biggest budget allocation was made for the Ministry of Defense. The the House of People's Representative assigned 90 billion Ethiopian bur for the Ministry of Defense, while 5 billion and 8 billion, 5 and 8 billion Ethiopian bur were uh, allocated, were allocated for rebuilding war-torn areas and the daily humanitarian assistance, respectively. You see the difference? That means they want to continue the war. They want to uh, spend more money, more money on drones, tanks, armored vehicles, and um, uh, and buying weapons and other hardware. That's why he was visiting United Arab Emirates. You know, hey, I got the money now, so I need your drones. That's their interest. Their interest is not to tackle the drought, the people dying, or you know, the shortage of food and uh, other uh, necessities. <clears throat> the parliament approved the additional budget with a majority vote, nine objections and seven abst abstention. The budget will be allocated for national security, humanitarian assistance, rehabilitation of war and conflict victims and other implementations uh, report say. The parliament allocated 106 billion Ethiopian bur for recurrent expenditure, 7 billion Ethiopian bur for capital expenditure, and 9 billion Ethiopian bur to cover expenses. It is indicated that there is a need to allocate more budget due to the economic pressure in the war torn areas and the inability to collect tax revenue on time due to COVID-19. A proposal was made to cover this additional budget and the budget deficit from domestic loans. Thank you at this standard. So this money, uh, you know, if we have a better leader, a leader who is concerned about uh, peace, safety, and the well-being of the people could be used for many, many other things. We have high employment, high unemployment, I mean. We have high unemployment in Ethiopia, including doctors, uh, medical doctors, don't have a job. Uh, and the new graduates and the former graduates, they don't have a job. So many, so many. And uh, we have the inflation and uh, all kind of problem plus the droughts and the other uh, you know basic service are uh, cut off due to this conflict so we could use to rebuild the country with this money but 
Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, his team, his prosperity party officials, they want to continue the war game because they are not dying. The ones dying are only the children of uh, the poor family and those uh, in the conflict. So that's the situation. Security Council discuss current affairs, uh, presence of illegal arms, trafficking, and the necessary action informal for in, in on informal forces. This is also from Ethiopia. The Security Council has uh, discussed the current security situation in Ethiopia and outlined directions that should be followed. State media report citing. Thomas Gantruner, Director General of the National Intelligence and Security Service, NISS. ABC reported that the Council has discussed the current situation in Ethiopia in relation to the activities by the Tigrayan forces. The Council has also assessed the existence of illegal arms trafficking and the informal forces connected to the activities of the Tigrayan forces. Turuna further said that necessary measures will be taken on informal forces based on studies conducted, the state media added. The Minister of Defense, Abraham Balai, PhD, on his part said that the Council's meeting assessed the country's security needs, national and regional issues and strengthening ties with the neighboring countries. Security forces are currently uh, preparing in all areas. So they discussed the, uh, the challenges they think. What are the challenges? The challenge they are talking about is uh, TDF, uh, Amara Fano, and Amara Militia, plus on, uh, you know, maybe uh, on Xene and uh, some uh, contraband. They don't just discuss about the need of, uh, uh, you know, the basic uh, necessities for the grants. They don't discuss about uh, the 800,000 plus, plus 4 million people looking for, uh, you know, uh, aid. And uh, they just, you know, they want to talk about war and uh, how to, maybe disarm Amara militia and the Fano, but they, they, they will face challenge right there. Uh, the Amara and uh, the, the Fano, uh, they are already heavily armed. It will not be easy uh, for the federal government now to dismantle them. And they will fight, they will fight. They are heavily armed, they are financed, uh, they are well organized. So we could see war uh, in this process. I don't know how they're gonna do it. They armed them first, they financed, they used them to fight the war against TDF. Now they want to dismantle them and uh, it will not be easy. So we will see. This is a statement U.S. State Department briefing on the situation in Ethiopia. And uh, this is an answer for the question about, uh, you know, U.S. diplomatic engagement with Ethiopia, aid delivery, TDF advance in Afar. So in answering questions for this question, you know, for these questions from the reporter, Mr. Uh, Need Price, uh, statement looks like this. So I will start by saying that we have long called for an immediate cessation of hostilities, a transparent investigation into human rights abuses and the violations by all actors, unhindered humanitarian access, and a negotiated resolution to the conflict in Ethiopia. And we have done that because it is a conflict that only that not only has inflicted humanitarian harm on the people of the region, but also poses a threat to peace 
and the security in the Horn of Africa. Reports of renewed fighting in the Afar region are very concerning and we repeat our call our calls to all actors to cease all offensive operations which also hinder that humanitarian access that we all know is we all know is so crucial we welcome the council of ministers january 26 determination to lift the nationwide state of emergency we hope this decision will be approved soon by the House of People's Representatives. We call on the government to release all those detained under the state of emergency and we encourage the active participation of all parties in an inclusive national dialogue that pursues a shared vision for a prosperous and a democratic Ethiopia. These discussions should also include commitments to comprehensive, transparent justice mechanism. As you know, it was last week, well, just a few days ago, I should say, where Assistant Secretary Fee and Special Envoy Star, Star Field held a productive meeting with Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and other government officials. The Assistant Secretary and the Special Envoy expressed the U.S. commitment to the unity, the sovereignty, and the territorial integrity of Ethiopia. They followed up on President Biden's constructive call with the Prime Minister that took place a couple of weeks ago now. They used the opportunity to encourage government officials to seize what we believe is a current opening for peace by Again, ending hostilities, negotiating a ceasefire, releasing all those detained, restoring humanitarian access on a sustainable, sustained basis, and laying the foundation for an inclusive national dialogue, importantly, with a participation of all parties. Fundamentally, we believe that this is the best path forward to end the widespread suffering and the human rights abuses that this conflict has wrought. That is why we are pursuing this robust diplomacy. That is why we are advanced advocating for this path. So credit State Department, U.S. State Department. Okay, this is the last one. Uh, statement by President Joe Biden on $15 minimum wage for federal workers and uh, contractors going into effect. A job is about more than a paycheck. It is about dignity. When I was running for president, I said it was past time to increase the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. Last year, I made a, a down payment on that pledge with executive order directing my administration to work toward uh, ensuring that employees working on federal contract and the federal employees earned a $15 per hour minimum wage. These directives go into effect this Sunday meaning nearly 70,000 federal workers will immediately start to earn $15 an hour and 300,000 employees of federal contractors will start to see a raise of $15 an hour reflected in their paychecks over the course of the year. These are the customer service representatives who answer the phones to ensure that Americans get the health care they deserve. Wildland fighters who protect our forests and the communities, custodians workers who keep our military bases clean and safe, nursing assistants who care for our veterans, and the laborers who build and repair federal facilities, 
the workers that will disproportionately benefit from this pay increase are women, workers of color, and workers with disabilities. This increase will provide those workers and their families a little more breathing room. And because we know that higher weights boost productivity and mean, uh, mean lower job turnover, these orders will allow the government to do its work better and faster. These workers benefiting from these actions are critical to the functioning of the federal government and our nation. And I am proud that their wages will begin to reflect that. I continue to urge Congress to raise the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour so that American workers can have a job that delivers dignity. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President, for, uh, you know, making a, your, your uh, part and uh, increasing, you know, this uh, minimum. Still, $15 is very low. They should get paid more, but it's very tough to get anything from the Congress. So they should increase uh, the minimum wage. Uh, you know, all the the food items are increased and uh, everything increase. So the minimum, the minimum wage, fifteen dollar, it's fair for now, and uh, we should appreciate uh, President Joe Biden for playing his part. So that's the uh, the last part of the, my reading. Thank you again. I have some videos to share with you, then conclude today's presentation. Thank you. There we go. There we go. There we go. In his retirement speech at the White House Thursday, Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer said American democracy remains an experiment. Uh, it's that next generation, the one after that, my grandchildren and their children, they'll determine whether the experiment still works. And of course, I am an optimist and I'm pretty sure it will. Breyer's retirement provides an opportunity for President Joe Biden to appoint his replacement, one of the most consequential actions for an American president. The Supreme Court is a key branch of the U.S. government that has the final say on the constitutionality of the actions of the administration, Congress, and the states. Biden said he will announce his nominee by the end of February. The person I will nominate will be someone with extraordinary qualifications, character, experience and integrity and that person will be the first black woman ever nominated to the united states supreme court the nine supreme court justices are appointed for life Breyer is one of only three liberal justices appointed by democratic presidents the rest were appointed by republicans including three during the four years of donald trump's administration in his eight years in office barack obama appointed two justices with republicans blocking his third pick with only 50 Democratic senators in the 100-seat U.S. Senate, Biden will need all their votes for his nominee to be confirmed. Biden would get at most one or two Republican votes if he picks a moderate judge, said Adam White, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. But the Democratic coalition does not want a moderate judge. Um, uh, they want somebody who's very strongly committed on certain issues, including criminal justice and other things. Further complicating this is the fact that President Biden pre-committed on the campaign trail to appointing uh, the first black woman to the Supreme Court. So his pool of potential nominees is, is limited by that as well. Biden aims to replace Breyer before midterm congressional elections in November. If Republicans retake control of the Senate, Biden will have a much harder time getting judicial and other nominees confirmed in the final two years of his term. Pat Suida Kuswara, VOA News, Washington.
Okay, so this opening for uh, the first African American against the United States and its woman allies for Supreme Court. in Iran. This time, it is a form of support for the Houthis of Yemen. Hundreds of protesters gather in the capital city of Tehran to condemn the recent airstrikes on a prison in Yemen by the Saudi led coalition. Now, chants of the war cry, Death to America, echoed in the streets. Now, the airstrike that hit the Yemen prison earlier this month has killed more than 90 people and wounded many others. It had also led to an internet blackout in the country, which was restored after four days. Meanwhile, fierce fighting is ongoing in Yemen between the Houthis and pro-government forces in Yemen's modern region. UAE-backed giant's brigade appeared to be on the offensive after the airstrike. After claims of expelling Houthi rebels from southern Shawa province earlier this month. Now, the giant's brigade also claimed to have taken full control of Burai, a district in Marib. Pro-government Yemeni forces are also expected to join the brigade. Okay, one more video. Riding through the streets of Wagadougou on Tuesday, two demonstrators fly a Russian flag, celebrating a military coup in the country a day earlier. They also turned out in Wagadougou's Place de la Nation to celebrate the military takeover. Some waved a Russian flag and told VLA, We don't want no more We are here because we need we first approach ya. France having two and who give us the subject. France has been giving military assistance to Burkina Faso during its six-year conflict with armed groups linked to Islamic State and Al-Qaeda. Earlier this month, the leader of neighboring Mali, Colonel Asimi Goita, welcomed mercenaries into the country from the Russian private security company Wagner, which has close links to the Kremlin. The mercenaries took over a military base in Timbuktu that was vacated by French troops in December. Demonstrators in Burkina Faso carried pictures of Goita at this week's demonstration and on January 22nd held a march in solidarity with Mali. Police broke up the gathering using flashbangs and tear gas. Analysts say in recent months there has been growing anti-French sentiment and a pivot towards Russia. Analysts say Mali is using Russian involvement as a bargaining chip after the West African bloc ECOWAS sanctioned the country for refusing to hold democratic elections within the next five years. The Malian military junta is trying to demobilize national feeling, if you like. Uh, it's, it seems to have brought the Russians in or sought to bring the Russians in as a sort of tool of leverage. It's not entirely clear how much practical military impact could actually bring. The Russian embassy for Burkina Faso and the military junta both declined to give VOA an interview. Bernard Bermuga, a Burkinabi political commentator, is pragmatic about the situation. Entre la France et la Russie, whether we pair with France or with Russia or any other country, is not out of generosity, is not free. They will want something in return. What is being searched for is someone who can help Burkina Faso get out of the situation in which it finds itself. Activist Francois Biogo attended the demonstration. The French must let us work things out. We are not against France, but France must manage their affairs and allow us to manage ours. Leave our soldiers. They will have peace of mind and be able to reflect on how to organize and free the people. Meanwhile, the Russian organization that trains troops in the Central African Republic 
has offered military support to Burkina Faso. It remains to be seen if Burkina Faso's new de facto leader, Paul Henri Demiba, will take up the offer. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso. Okay. So that's uh, the challenge the Burkina Faso faced and uh, <clears throat> the love they have for uh, Russia and uh, they are celebrating the military coup as yes, in contrary to the one we saw in uh, Sudan. Sudan, they don't want the military coup, but here they are uh, enjoying celebrating the military coup and also calling for Russia to help. So we will see if they will be successful. Usually the military will be uh, unless given to the uh, civilian leadership, the military will be uh, remain or become a dictator anyway. So thank you so much for uh, taking your time with me. Uh, I appreciate it. Please share subscribe to my channel, like, and uh, comment on my video. Thank you, and uh, be safe. See you next time.